Okay, we're live. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the April 26th, 2021 study session of the University City City Council to order. Joining us this evening is the Renaming Streets and Parks Task Force. Uh, prior to turning it over to uh, Mr. Rose and then on to the chair, uh, are there any changes to the regular session agenda for this evening? Honorable Mayor, I, yes. I don't have a change to the regular agenda, but I would ask to pull item number four from this agenda that was requested by yes, one of the sponsors. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Hearing nothing for the regular meeting, uh, Mr. Rose. I'm on Mayor and Council members. In September of 2020, I'm sorry, yeah, September of 2020, you established the uh, Streets and Parks Renaming uh, Task Force. Tonight, they are here to present their findings and recommendation. And so, Ms. Armstrong is chairing the task force, and I will turn things over to her. Ms. Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Rose. And thank you, Honorable Mayor Crow and the council persons for giving us this opportunity to study the names of the streets and for the 120 days granted to us by resolution 2020-12. If I may, I'd like to take a moment of reverence the unarmed armed Americans killed by the police. Please, let's take a moment. Thank you very much. You have a copy of the presentation in your books, Hey Alice, as well as our final report. But we thought it was best to summarize today at Alice's suggestion. So um, at the first slide, Mr. Let me see if I'll share. Okay, sorry, I'm just joining. Okay, no worries. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Mr. Hamilton, would you share the information on this one? Oh goodness, it's been such a long time. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a map that's just showing the three uh, wards uh, and uh, wards, the east part of wards one and two were the first parts of University City. Uh, there are a few neighborhoods north of Olive that were also very early, but they were originally started as unincorporated communities and then added into the, uh, to the city. And uh, after the city was incorporated, then all subdivision plats had to be approved by the city before uh, it uh, before it could be filed and the lots could be sold. And uh, most of the street names come from those plats rather than from any decision that the city made directly. Thank you, Mr. Elsley, Mr. Hamilton. So who we are on the task force. It was a seven member task force. I wanna thank Mr. Hamilton for being our historian, Don Fitz for being our activist, and the rest of us just very concerned citizens. Alice Boone, Mimi Taylor Hendricks, Don Fitz, Elsie Hamilton, Holly Ingram, Andrew Wool, and myself, Susan Armstrong. Next slide. Holly, would you tell, tell the council about this? Yes, um, again, thank you mayor and council members uh, for putting together the task force and a special thanks to the staff for all your work in supporting us. Um, the resolution 2012, I just wanted to draw attention to a couple of pieces that stood out for us and that we focused on the words of inclusion and equity, cooperation, tolerance and understanding that University City has a rich tradition of diversity, acceptance and tolerance and we continue to work on finding ways to institutionalize the welcoming um, culture and efforts here in University City. Um, there was a special part of the resolution that asked to look at the condemning the message of white nationalism while encouraging ongoing respectful and honest conversations among the people of University City. We were given, these seven resident members were given uh, 120 days to work and we did. Uh, we adopted this, uh, I think we began work in October and completed 
the work in February, February 1st of 2021, we reviewed over 200 street names. And you will see um, our mandate of the task force on page three of the report. What we wanted to briefly go over was the executive summary and then several other task force members will dive a little bit deeper into each of the um, findings and recommendations. Um, first page of the executive summary, you'll note that um, again, we focused on the criteria of looking at street names and did the person whom the street was named after, one, practice inclusion and equity, did they welcome all, and did they condemn white supremacy? We came up with a three-tier system for offensive names. So if the person did not meet the university city criteria, the name was considered offensive and then placed into one of the three tiers. Tier one being offensive by the task force resolution, tier two being the names of slave owners, and tier three possibly offensive but further research needed. The list of the four offensive names in tier one begins on page five of the report and then continues with the tier two and tier three names listed. If we go to the next page of the executive summary, the task force also looked at new names for consideration uh, and implementation. And we've given you some possibilities for criteria for new names for consideration. You'll see those listed here on the executive summary. Um, there's also a wealth of citizen comments that begin on page 15 of the report and a chart that we've assembled of new names that were collected from citizens and task force members to be considered on the last pages of this report. Finally, we looked at future actions to be recommended, recognizing that the most powerful part of looking at street names and considering renaming is the process by which we as a community go through and the conversations that we have about making decisions about street names and whether we rename them. So we listed some potential future actions that could be recommended in addition to considering actually renaming streets. Um, we also came up with things such as um, holding well-publicized Zoom webinars for all city residents, um, reconvening the task force. Most members, if not all, were, con were willing to continue to do work um, on this project. And then you'll see towards the end, possibilities of renaming ceremonies or other celebrations of inclusion um, and the diversity of you city residents and students. Thank you, Holly. Do we have any questions at this point? Um, Susan, we may need to hold, the, since there's so many people on, we can't really keep track of who's wanting to speak. We may need to hold our questions probably till the, uh, till perfect. the end. <laughs> perfect. Okay, um, let's go to the next slide. Mimi, can you comment on this slide? Thank you. Um, I will include in this meeting what was read in many of our task force meetings. As we gather together today, we acknowledge that this land is the traditional territory of the Osage Nation and the Illinois Confederacy, which includes the Cahokia, Peoria, and Illini peoples. We therefore pay our respect to the elders, both past and present, and may we nurture our relationship with our native neighbors and the shared responsibilities to their homelands where we all reside today. Specifically, we commit to learning more about the people, history, and contemporary concerns of these indigenous communities. And we do this, if you go to the next slide, please. We do this because in our studies, we learned that the Osage Native Americans occupied these lands. And we know about the mound builders, particularly over in the Cahokia area, but also in South City, which is Sugarloaf Mound. There were villages of two to 3,000 people they were on both the north and the south banks of the Missouri River as well. And in 1100 AD, there were populations greater than the population of London at the time. The smallpox epidemic decimated the populations beginning around the early 1800s. And the smallpox will be mentioned later in connection with one of the street names that we found offensive. 
in 1808, 52 million acres of Missouri territory were purchased from the Osage for $5,000, which is the equivalent of five thousandths of one cent per acre. And later, Missouri legislation made it even illegal for an Osage native to live within Missouri. Osage, of course, means the children of the middle waters. And Walter Johnson, an author, argues that the genocide of the Native Americans in the Mississippi Valley paved the way for the expansion of plantation slavery and its development into a fully capitalistic economy with global ambitions. Don. Thank you, Mimi. Mm -hmm. Don, do you want to introduce our next uh, video speaker? Yes, this is going to be very brief. Uh, the name of the person who made this video is Red Scott. He made it for us. Uh, he uh, um, documented the 1811 slave revolt in Louisiana, and he pretty much describes himself. So I'll, I'll let him take it away. Now, let me know if you can see in here. I'm a visual artist, and my work is shown in the Whitney Museum, MoMA PS1, the Walker Art Center. I've received awards from the Creative Capital Foundation and the United States Artists Fellowship, as well as funding from the Open Society Foundations and Ford Foundations for some of my projects. In 2019, I presented the project Slave Rebellion Reenactment. This was a community engaged artwork that reenacted the largest rebellion of enslaved people in the United States. It was a revolt that happened in 1811 outside of New Orleans. And it's a project that, that took up a history that's been tremendously hidden and buried. And it's not a project about slavery. It was a project about freedom. In thinking about this project, I really understood that you can't understand the United States if you don't understand slavery. And you can't understand slavery without understanding slave revolts. As I said, this revolt was the largest rebellion of enslaved people in the history of the United States, and most people don't even know it exists. The aims of this rebellion were to seize all of Orleans territory, which was modern day in Louisiana, and set up an African Republic in the New World. And slavery would have been outlawed there, much the way it was in Haiti, which was a part of inspiration from some of the rebels. This rebellion would have changed US and world history. When we reenacted it, we actually had 350 black and indigenous people marching over the course of two days for 24 miles on the outskirts of New Orleans, on the levees and in the streets of the small towns and that troops that we were marching through. We chanted on to New Orleans, freedom or death, we're going to end slavery, join us. We had 19th century period specific clothing. We also had prop weapons, muskets, sickles, sabers, and cane knives. It was a very sort of startling sight to see, but also one that brought a tremendous joy to some people. One of the things that was important about this is that it actually challenged people's understanding of history. The way most people understand history, it's a white supremacist view of history. As I said earlier, you can't understand the United States if you don't understand slavery, and you can't understand slavery if you don't understand slave revolts. That's just really basic, but most people don't have this understanding. When I began doing this work, I would go down to New Orleans. I'm, I live and based in New York. I was going to New Orleans and I could see the tremendous harm and the effect that it had on people, particularly black people, to drive down Jefferson Davis Highway. Jefferson Davis was the leader of the Confederate States of America. And I know that in Germany, I can't drive down Hitler Highway. I couldn't go to Goebbels or Goring University, but people in the United States can do the equivalent of that for high schools named after enslavers. I could also see the tremendous harm that's done, particularly to black children, when they were taken to do plantation tours on as part of high school trips or, or middle school trips. And they would see plantations that were frankly the sites of genocide, but they would learn it from the perspective of the enslavers and the horror that that was. Imagine if you went to see Auschwitz and you heard about the difficulty that the commandant had. That would be completely absurd and nobody would tolerate it. But in the US, that's just a tourist attraction. So another thing I was learning when I was doing Slave Rebellion Reenactment, because it was a project that took six years to build, the epic spectacle lasted two days, but it was a community engaged project. I was talking with people, particularly students at HBCUs, and often they would tell me that they were assigned to come to the lecture and they didn't really want to be there. They didn't want to know any more about slavery or know anything about slavery. And when I would talk with them, it became clear that they were somewhat they couldn't understand why their ancestors allowed themselves to become slaves is how they saw it. 
And really, they didn't understand that their ancestors were enslaved and something was done to them. It was great harm done to them. And the part of the reason that we have the freedom that we have today is because of all the resistance that the, the enslaved, the rebellion, the revolts, the resistance. These students didn't know that there were over 250 documented slave rebellions of 10 or more people in the United States. Not only did they not know this history, they were looking at the present day reality and see the disproportionate number of black people that are in prison. And they would look at the, the disparities in wealth and health outcomes, and they would think there's something wrong with black people. And so this project actually challenged that. Even in the conversations I would have, when they learned about these slave rebellions, they were like, wait, this is something we don't know. Who kept this from us? And we need to tell other people about this. They wanted to tell their friends about it. They really wanted to dig into the history. When they, thought, when they understood it wasn't about slavery, but it was about resistance and fighting back, that was inspiring to them. So slave rebellion reenactment, both in its process of making the work, but also the, the two-day spectacle, it challenged all of this. And it posed that the slave rebels were the were the most radical, they had the most radical view of freedom in the United States. It was far more radical than the thoughts that Thomas Jefferson and, and George Washington had, the founding fathers. Their conception of freedom was predicated upon owning people. These slave rebels, they had this radical understanding that the key question in the United States at the time was that you had to get rid of slavery to get to a just society. Charles DeLons, the main leader, and some of the other leaders were real heroes. These people should be known. And when these students heard about this, it lifted a weight off of them and it was truly inspiring. The project, if you see some of the images or the videos, there's a really good video on the, on the Guardian newspaper that they did. It shows the tremendous inspiring vision that this was, but it's, you see some of these reenactors literally dancing with joy. Mm -hmm. um, it was life-changing for many. Some of them described it as the most important thing they'd ever done in their lives. I wanted to do this project because I wanted that effect for both the reenactors, but also people who saw it for black people more broadly. This project got coverage in, you know, feature coverage in Vanity Fair, the New York Times. I was interviewed by Christiane Amanpour on CNN. This went broadly into people to get them to rethink American history and the history and position of black people in society and posit that there were some real heroes that are suppressed and kept from us. And I think that's tremendously important for how people view themselves, but how also other people that are not black view us. There was an insightful comment by one reenactor when asked to describe what, what they felt about it. And they felt, said, I felt I finally got a chance to represent someone who most people may not even know exists. That is tremendously huge to say, look, there's this history that is stolen from us. And I got a chance to embody this and let other people know that such people did exist. If people thought that the people with the most radical view of freedom were the enslaved, that would tremendously change things about the present. And that's why I really encourage you to not only take up the mantle of erasing these racist street names, but actually honor people who were real rebels and fighters, including you know, leaders of slave revolts. So thank you for your time. I wish I could have joined you today. I have a conflict that, that prevents me from, from being with you in person and to be able to answer your questions. But I really hope that you, you know, follow through on this commitment and, and put some great street names on in, in the streets in Missouri. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Get back to the screen. Thank you, Don, for having that video sent to us. And Susan, just, just a reminder to folks that that video was shown on PBS just earlier this year, the reenactment. So he talked about some other media that covered it, but it was also one of the programs that was shown on PBS Channel 9 earlier this year. Excellent, thank you. The 1811 revolt reenactment. Mm -hmm. All right, offensive names. Council persons, mayor, are you ready? Sure. <laughs> Insist on the list. Don, can you tell us what you learned about Lord Jeffrey Amherst? Sure. M many Amherst students have come to see Lord Jeffrey as a symbol of white oppression for advocating that na Native Americans be given smallpox infected blankets to slaughter them. The military commander who led British victories in the French and Indian War 
and for whom this town and others in the Northeast was named, wrote in a postscript to a letter in 1763. You will do well to try to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets, as well as try every other method that can serve to extirpate this execrable race. He was severely criticized by military subordinates on both sides of the Atlantic. Nevertheless, Amherst was promoted to Lieutenant General in March, 1765. 17 years, seven years later, he was appointed Lieutenant General and he soon gained the confidence of George III, who had initially hoped the position would go to a member of the royal family. In 2008, Mi'kmaq spiritual leader John Joe Sark called the name of Fort Amherst Park of Prince Edward Island a terrible blotch on Canada. He said to have a place named after General Amherst would be like having a city in Jerusalem named after Adolf Hitler. It's disgusting. None of the many letters that Amherst wrote show a deranged mind or an obsession with cruelty. Amherst's venom was strictly reserved for Indians. Amherst had been at war with the French as much as with the Indians, but he showed no obsessive no desire to eliminate them. They were apparently his worthy en enemy. So two conclusions I would reach. One, Amherst cannot be forgiven for the racism of the society in which he lived because he violated standards of his day. Two, Amherst Street in University City must not be ignored because the street was named after a college, which was named after a town, which is named after the murder. They all trace back to the name of, uh, of the grandfather of biological warfare. Thank you, Don. We've been in communication with Amherst and they are struggling with the legacy. Thank you. Mr. Elsley, can you talk to us about what you learned about General Stonewall Jackson? Yes, uh, uh, Jackson was uh, Robert E. Lee's uh, most uh, close associate and uh, his death in battle in 1863 was a blow that uh, that Lee really didn't recover from. And so those two names have been linked uh, ever since that time. Uh, and the way it came to this area was that when the Hanley family was uh, subdividing part of their property as an addition to the city of Clayton, or the at that time, just the village of Clayton, they uh, named two of the streets, Lee and Jackson. Lee, I think, is less than a block long today, but Jackson was laid out on what was a property line between two uh, major land grants. And so it was very easy to extend that to the north. And that's how it ended up in both uh, areas. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. So that's a tier, tier one name. So far we have Amherst and Jackson that we recommend for renaming. Don, can you talk to us about President Woodrow Wilson? Yes, Woodrow Wilson was a racist by today's standards and he was a racist by the standards of his time. In 1881, Wilson defended the South's suppression of black, black voters, saying that they were being denied the vote not because their skin was dark, but because their minds were dark. Wilson's racism wasn't the matter of a few unfortunate remarks here or there. It was a core part of his political identity. Wilson described Southern black people as ignorant and inferior race. As president of Princeton University, Wilson refused to admit any black students and erase the earlier admissions of black students from the <sighs> university's history. He oversaw the resegregation of multiple agencies of the federal government, which had been integrated since the 1870s. At a 1913 cabinet meeting, the postmaster general wanted to segregate the railway mail service because workers shared glasses, towels, and washrooms. Wilson did not object. W.A.B. Du Bois wrote of one colored clerk who could not be segregated due to the nature of his work and consequently had a cage built around him to separate him from whites. During his presidency, Wilson crippled the up upward mobility of African-Americans who had jobs in the federal government. Wilson himself fired 15 out of black supervisors in the federal service and replaced them with whites. He wrote, there are no government positions for Negroes a Negro's place is in the cornfield. In 1914, the civil service began demanding photographs to accompany employment applications in order to weed out blacks. Wilson's most famous uh, work was steeped in lost cause mythology. The book, book was sympathetic to the Ku Klux Klan. Wilson saw slavery as relatively, really, relatively benign, the Klan as harmless, and reconstruction as a disaster. He resurrected the KKK by showing the propaganda film the birth of a nation at the White House, leading to a massive revival in white supremacist thought. 
Wilson was so destructive in his racist actions that it would be negligent to simply rededicate this street to another person named Wilson. The name should be totally removed from the street so that no one ever associates it with the president. Thank you, Don. So that gives us three names that we recommend so far, Amherst, Jackson, and Wilson, the 1,000 feet of Wilson Avenue. Pershing, General John Pershing, Pershing Elementary School, Pershing Avenue. He was born in McLeod, Missouri. He was named Blackjack. He taught black school children um, in 1878. He commanded the Buffalo Soldiers in the, in the Indian campaigns, the Comanche Wars, the Sioux Wars. Um, he also fought Asians in the Philippines. He also fought Mexicans in the Southwest. So we talk about uh, inclusion and white supremacy and white nationalism. Um, General, General John Pershing's life summarizes to be a white nationalist. Now, this is, I think, is the important part that he's received a lot of credit for. He served in the Western Front in World War I from 1917 to 1918. Now he supported troops separate but equal. So that line caught me when I was researching General Pershing. We split our research up based by people in First Ward, research the streets in First Ward. We tried to um, organize in that manner. So when I saw Gen General Pershing and separate but equal, <clears throat> it brought me to a story from my own family, my own uh, maternal grandfather, a man I never met because he died in despair. Um, he fought in World War I. Now, reading um, Pershing's autobiography, he was very conscious to put the white troops under American command with American supplies. However, the black troops, the black World War I troops, he sent to my, my uh, grandfather's regiment, went to France, not as a fighting unit, but as to replace the units, the, France, the French soldiers as they fell. So these soldiers saw combat in multiple battles. So they went overseas, they fought in World War II. So you ask yourself, how did a, a celebrated World War I vet die in despair? Separate but equal. My grandfather was not allowed to buy a home for his family, my grandmother and their children. So he, he died in rental property, in a boarded rental property in a poor Potter town. So, the sum of Pershing and his policies have an incredible impact on the economic gap. gap. What we learned about slaveholders, this is our tier two list. Mimi? Yes, we developed the tiers uh, of concerns regarding street names. And in tier two, we list streets named after people, primarily given the name because the road ran through their property, but who are also listed on the 1850 or 1860 census of slaveholders. And those names include Robert Forsyth, John Gay, Martin Hanley, Peter Lindell, John McKnight, William Price, Virginia Cabany, James Clemens, George Kingsland, and William Woodson. Thank you, Mimi. Well, we also learned by looking at the 1860 and 1850 Schedule II census that listed the slaves, that there were 8,000 slave inhabitants in 1860 in St. Louis area. And this is not an all-inclusive uh, list, but the names that we saw that were named for towns now so these are slaveholding families, enslavers, who now have towns named for them. Ralph Clayton, Page, Jennings, O'Fallon, Ferguson, and Sappington. That's not all inclusive. But the, our area towns are named for enslavers. Tier three. Okay, uh, 
I'm Alice Boone of Aurora 3, even though the name appears as Mimi. I'm not her sister or her twin, just using <laughs> her link to uh, access the, uh, the meeting. And again, we divided the uh, importance into three tiers. Tier one, you've already heard. Tier two, you've already heard also in terms of slave owners. Uh, tier three, we felt were streets that were in the different wars that were possibly offensive. However, more research is needed. For instance, we have Princeton, which is in uh, Ward uh, two. And obviously Princeton is named after the university, which uh, if you looked at the um, news recently, and maybe not so recently, uh, they've admitted to racist practices. Yale, obviously also named after a university. Uh, Yale is um, founded by a slave owner, as well as um, you know, other streets prior to what you heard in tier two. Again, tier three, we do need to do more research. And we also have Chamberlain, Camden, and Washington as uh, additional streets where we felt strongly that we needed to look a little bit further into these streets and possibly uh, consider them along with the streets named in the other two tiers. We're turning it over to Andrew. Andrew hasn't made it yet, so I'll speak on behalf of Andrew and say thank you. Thank you for this beautiful, vibrant, diverse community that we have and then we all enjoy. So I'll let it go, we'll go for questions. And Susan, if you can, uh, thank you. Thank you very much to all the committee members I'm, I'm, and task force members. I will uh, save some remarks for uh, later towards a little bit further into the uh, study session. I would like to yield now to any of my colleagues who have questions or uh, comments for task members, uh, task force members, because as you can tell from this group, they uh, have clearly done their research. So I don't, I'm not sure if members of council have questions and with this many uh, people on the screen, it would help me a great deal if we go back to, we're gonna go back to elementary school and raise your hand or your finger so that I can see you. And uh, we're going, Mr. Kusick, who seems to be our, our incognito man as he continues to grow his uh, beard. We, uh, we'll start with you, Tim. Thank you, Mayor. I hope you can hear me fine. Um, yes. Mr. Hamilton, when he was doing his report on um, uh, uh, Jackson. Uh, uh, on, on Jackson, yeah. He mentioned that um, the Hanley family uh, apparently, uh, the Hanley Avenue or Hanley is named after were the ones that decided to name um, one street Pershing and or one street Jackson and the other Lee. Right. Uh, and I see the Han and Esley. I see the Ham Hanley family owned slave, but uh, what again? What was their logic for naming those streets after Confederate generals? Well, uh, Hanley Martin Hanley was a strong Confederate sympathizer. And, uh, and most of the slave owning people in the county were. Uh, it was the Germans and the people who were bu small business people from the city who, who, uh, who were not uh, Confederate sympathizers. Um, and so, uh, well, it, it, this was a, a very mixed county because of that. But in the center of the state, uh, that area was called Little Dixie, which was largely a rural area, and they all supported the Confederacy. Our governor at the outbreak of the, of the war, uh, Claiborne Jackson, was from that area, and he anticipated that Missouri would join the Confederacy. So after they lost, there were still, uh, as we still see today, many people who were flying the stars and bars, and uh, many people who kept that grudge, you know, for a century afterward. Thank you. You know, Mr. Hamilton if, if and, and Don, you guys can elaborate for the city council about the slave revolts, that the slave stampedes that occurred in Missouri. There was a one in, so the, the, the sympathizer for the Confederate, but also the slave stampedes where they were gathering slaves, um, husbands, wives, children were gathering and just 
breaking and running towards free states. Up in Canton, Missouri, Don, I don't mean to stay, stay your thunder. Um, they, in Northeast Missouri, they gather and they just broke for the free state of Iowa or the free state of Illinois. Illinois. So we had the sympathizers and we also had African-Americans yearning for freedom and bringing the country with it. Next question. Don, did you want to add anything or are we good to go? Oh, that was 1849, the Canton Stampede. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's, uh, I don't think there's any evidence that Canton Street in, in University City is named after the Canton Stampede, but it always could have the name Stampede tagged onto the street. <laughs> and then, then it would be named after an event that, that, was a, that I would perceive as a positive event. They did not make it to Illinois. Uh, they, they were they were trying they were trying to go to Illinois and did not make it. Mm -hmm. So the the stampede occurred in Canton, Missouri. Really, Canton, up in right. yeah, oh, right across definitely. the river from around Quincy. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. I grew up not far from there. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Okay, I think Mr. Clay has his hand up. Uh, th thank you, Mayor Crow, and certainly I, I offer my thanks to the uh, committee. We know you uh, put significant amount of work as reflected in this report. Um, into your deliberations. So we thank you so much for your service. Um, I wanted to ask about the uh, page 10 is your future actions recommended. And the first item is um, the Zoom webinar in the, in the age of COVID, unfortunately, um, that would involve those residents living on impacted streets. And could you say a little bit more about your vision of of their role, of residents who live on these streets in, in this process. Ali, would you like to take that one? Sure. Um, and I invite other task force members to raise your hand if you want to add to that. But I think, again, reemphasizing that what we feel is most important about this work is the process by which our community goes through to recognize and honor the past. Um, and set the tone for a future which embraces the values of University City. And so it would be important to include those on streets where uh, a renaming is being considered to gather their thoughts, to allow them to speak about things um, and possibly to share and educate them on uh, where that name came from. I was surprised by um, some of the research that I did and others did on the task force um, I think we all know and love University City and, and University City has so many great connections to um, past residents and current residents. Um, one person I spoke to, you know, mentioned growing up as a young child and learning that the street that she lived on was named after a slaveholder. And she was surprised and there was no context or further information given to her. And she carried that weight through her life, kind of, you know, wondering and struggling what to do with that. And so I think it's important to, um, even if streets are not renamed, um, but the hope is that for sure these four will be, that um, there's some education about it because it's more than just changing the name. Um, it's having a conversation about um, our community and our values and why we have those values. Stacy, you, are you taking care of on that one, right? Yeah, I, I was just saying thank you. Okay, Don? Uh, yes, I think it's important to keep in mind if we're, or if we're going to target particular people to be involved in a discussion that we really place an emphasis on uh, involving university high school, university city high school students, because they are the people who are going to be here for a very long time. And we heard from Dred Scott about how so many students have been affected by having names after slaveholders or na names um, in, in, in acting as if, you know, nothing, you, you know, that was something wrong with black people that they would tolerate this sort of situation. And so I think it's very important for university students who we involve several in some of the work that we did. And I think they really need to be involved in any sort of discussion of renaming streets. I agree with Don and, and Holly. But there was one particular uh, citizen comment that came from Michaela Flowers, high school student. She, she said, surely with the tight knit communities within University City, no form of ignorance like racist street names would be tolerated. So again, they're, they're, they're counting on us. What other questions or comments do members of the council have for members of the street renaming? Any, anything from anybody? 
Alita. Yeah, I just, um, first of all, want to thank all of you for all the work that you've done and for um, bringing this conversation to us today. Um, I think it's a really important topic. And um, I think that there are a lot of uh, different facets that, that we need to consider. And I really appreciate all of your perspectives. Um, I, you know, one thing that keeps coming to my mind is, and, and uh, Council Member Clay kind of touched on this, are the people that are being affected, the people that live on these streets that will, will be affected by this. And I would be interested in, in making sure that they get the information of what that process would entail. So, um, you know, that, so that they know that, you know, it's going to entail going to the city records or going to their post office or, you know, all of the steps in that process so that they can have that as part of their decision-making process and part of their, the opinion that they're going to give to us. And um, so, you know, I'd hope that somehow we could get that worked in to the, an informational program for them. Um, I know that there are a lot of, you know, elderly people or people that have a hard time getting out of their home. And I think, you know, it would be important to have some kind of, um, you know, information on how they could, they could be assisted to, to um, facilitate this name change if it came, you know, if it comes to that. Right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Smotherson. Uh, thank you, Mayor Crow. I, and again, I wanna thank this committee for doing a great job the information, even for me, is enlightening. It's just, it's, it's awesome. So one of the things that I wanted to ask is, uh, the video with Dred Scott, is this link, a link to that video that we just saw? And if that is, that's great, and I'll use that. The other question is that the, the link to, or how, how do we access his video? And if you can provide that information to us as council members, I would appreciate it. Um, and uh, because he made some very, very important points. And then, and so I, I just want to keep that. The other thing, the other aspect I wanted to just ask one very quick question, and that is um, the Amherst, Amherst, whatever it's called, Amherst University. Mm -hmm. Was the university actually named after Lord Jeffrey Amherst? I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Uh, the uh, Amherst was originally founded in w Williamstown, Massachusetts, and it was mm -hmm. called uh, it was called Williams College. And it was that was so far west but, that nobody would go there. So they moved the whole college to the town of Amherst and and they named it Amherst specifically so that people would know it was easier to get to. And then the Williams College that we have now was founded later in that same town, uh, Williamstown. So uh, originally the name of the college had nothing at all to do with uh, uh, General Amherst, but the town, the naming of the town did. So, so the naming of our street here was named after the college. Yes. Is that correct? Okay, all right. And, and, and then the last part of my question, the last question that I have is, uh, how will we, there, there are two streets, I think, in that first tier, Pershing and Jackson, that connect to other cities or municipalities. Um, are we addressing this issue with those municipalities? And that's my last question. Uh, well, I have talked to uh, the city of Clayton, and they have a committee also, which is primarily uh, concerned with marking good things about the history that they want more people to know about. But they said that they would, they were committed to following whatever decision University City came up with regarding Jackson. Yeah. They haven't talked to anybody to the north though, uh, in uh, uh, Pagedale. Yeah. And you know, uh, Mr. Hamilton, thank you. Something that I found as looking at the slaveholders name, the names of the enslavers, you know, our name is University City. We were founded in 1906. So we weren't named for a slaveholder. So we have a lot of leverage, freedom, and uh, opportunity. Uh, you know, again, Ralph Clayton was a slaveholder. So, <laughs> Don, did you have a follow up? Uh, yeah, uh, a couple of things. One is that I am her street. I don't think it's correct to say that there's no d direct connection to the general who committed the mass murder. 
it's unquestionable that the town was named after General Amherst and the college was named after the town. I well, mean, that would be, okay, but, but there, that is a connection. And, and so I, I think it would be sort of like saying that if a, a, a city was named after Hitler and we named a high school after the city as Adolf Hitler High School, that would be okay. No, I don't, don't think it's okay. It traces right back to him. Uh, the, the other thing is that uh, I just wanted to acknowledge my wife, Barbara Chikaria, who, who actually found the, Dred, found the connection to Dred Scott. And then I followed up on that and asked him if he uh, would uh, speak at our task force meeting. And he said yes, until uh, he, he checked the schedule. And then he said, but he would make a video for us. Now that video is on YouTube and anyone can use the, uh, the link to YouTube to use that video for educational purposes. I mean, that's what he does his life, do, you know, that's his life is, is doing educational events in an artistic way. So we'd be very happy if people use that video. And also I have contact information for him if anybody wishes to uh, contact Dred Scott. Hey, I know we have a, I'm not sure, I know I, know I had, I think I said, I saw Holly's hand up and then I'm not sure if I saw Susan's. Uh, Holly, did you have a comment to make? Just a quick one about Amherst, the, the college in our research, um, they had a statue of Lord Jeffrey Amherst and he was considered a mascot of sorts for the university and they have removed that um, mm -hmm. uh, relationship and that statue acknowledging uh, his participation. Um, this one was near and dear to some of our hearts because it's so blatant that um, the streets along Midland are named after colleges, and yet we have no HBCUs that are listed that are, that are street names, and it seemed like a great opportunity to do that and to reflect uh, the importance of that. So um, I just wanted to make sure that note was added. We did Morehouse, and that was specifically named at the request of the uh, city council. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I, can't, I, I apologize that I'm not sure if anyone else had their, their hand up. We are knocking on 620, so we just need to, people have not had a bite of the apple. If you'd like to have your bite of the apple, this is a good time. I don't know if anyone has anything else uh, that they'd like to add or comment on. I have a couple of comments I would like to make, and I'm not sure, I'm not seeing any hands come up. So, uh, and I don't know if the city manager has anything he would like to add. Uh, oh, Alita, yes. I just have one question about the the idea of um, renaming the streets with someone that has the same last name. And I know that Don, you kind of said Wilson. You you know you wouldn't be in favor of any person with the name Wilson. Um, you know, but uh, you know someone that has the last name Jackson is Mary Jackson, who is the first African American that was um, the first female engineer in NASA in in nineteen fifty eight. So you know if if you said we're going to rename Jackson Elementary the Mary Jackson Elementary School. Would that be something that that people seem receptive to? Well, we don't get to talk about schools too much here, just so you know. <laughs> that, that'll be school yeah, just, well, but, in connection with the street, you know, that it's the same street, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the details, candidly, we're going to have to work through, I think, uh, and, and one kind, I know that I think Steve had his hand up, uh, you know, one of the probably the wisest things we can do is look at the communities who have already been down this path and, and do a lessons learned from some of the other cities so that we know what's happening. When someone asks about Pershing, you know, Pershing goes all the way through the city. I'm not sure the city of St. Louis is going to jump at, at, uh, at, at renaming streets right now with all that they have going on, but they may. And of course, we'll provide all that information uh, to them. But I do think that we will need to rely on the city manager and his staff to not only look at what other cities have done as at, really as much as anything for implementation, because I think we all agree uh, uh, what Holly has said, I think is very true. And that is that the conversation is as important as what the street is named and, mm -hmm. and getting the conversation right with all of our citizens. And I do clearly include the citizens who are going to be impacted uh, by this in that because I think they may have some different feelings than everyone else. But I think we there, that conversation needs to be broad and we need to work on that. At the same time, there needs to be a parallel effort as to how does this actually get implemented? Because there's we are uh, 
as we have found with COVID, if any of you have volunteered at all while we've been giving shots, you know, we have a number of people that have a hard time getting out. We have a number of people that don't have access to the internet. And in University City, we do our best to try to make sure that everyone gets the same uh, treatment. And so we need to make sure that we get this information out to folks. And I've still got some other comments to make, but I, I can't, I don't know who all, Steve, real quickly, Don, before I, Steve, you had a comment or no? It, you just, just really quick. And I think it just dovetails with what you said. I think, and I just want to thank all the members. I think we got a really good group of people that have insight into these issues. And I think what we may see in the community in, in, in some regard when they start to bring this out is kind of a real quick reaction of, oh, that's going to be very complicated. It's going to cost money. It's going to be hard to implement. And there'll be comments of, uh, well, I didn't know that. Nobody knows who that was named after After all these years. Why are we doing this? And I think our, I think these comments that I've heard from Holly and Don and, and Mayor Crow the, as well from you, I think you're really giving us the discussion points to talk to people to say exactly why this is more important and, and can weigh against the pragmatic and practical and inconvenience and the I didn't know that kind of issues we might face at the first blush look at this topic. So I, I that's why I think this was a really good way for you guys to present it to us. It really helps us to talk about those issues. So I'm really happy to hear how that is all being portrayed for us and giving us something to jump off on. And, and then, you know, we'll have to deal with those kind of rolling it out kind of planning issues that, that we have to deal with. So I, I just a big thank you to all you guys. Yeah. So Councilman, yes. Councilman, and one, one of the uh, citizens was very brave and she said, Amazon will still be able to find you if the name of your street changes. And all the time, <laughs> Jeff. I also wanted to let you look at the last pages of your report. And again, as Holly referred to, there's all the names that we were able to collect from the citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Um, I completely agree with uh, Steve's comments, all of them. Uh, also wanted to thank all of you. Um, this was very enlightening. Um, you know, I, I'm probably the youngest uh, member of council, um, but the reality is we all, we, we all share uh, a history that I think we're not all proud of clearly. Uh, and I think as, as uh, time has moved on and, and this Zoom meeting is testament to, um, uh, it really speaks to the changes in our, our country, in the world, in our community uh, that we, we, we are having this conversation right now. And so I just wanted to say, I really appreciate that, all the work that uh, all the task force members uh, did and uh, I, I think we all uh, as council members uh, will be very thoughtful moving forward. So thank you. I, I know that Don had his hand up real quick. Okay. Uh, okay. I just wanted to apologize for something that I did during the work of the task force. And that was <laughs> actually I didn't do. And that was I got so absorbed in that that I neglected a lot of other tasks. And so when we were finishing up during the last month, I really neglected looking over things, including the very first cover page of the task force, which, and it's my negligence as much as anybody else's, maybe I was, I, I should have done it. Uh, but the thing is, it says nothing about that this task force came into existence because of in 2020 of the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Movement exploding all over the country. And I, I think that's very unfortunate because whatever we do, anybody in the future, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years from now, need when they look at the work that we did, they need to know what sparked it because that may be in a different part of their mind that they read about the great demonstrations of 2020. So I think that's very important. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that um, I, I totally agree with Terry Crow when he says that we need to have a full discussion. I really think it needs to involve everyone. Uh, those of us who have lived in University City for a while have known that council meetings are not only not always totally pleasant and polite. Sometimes people get very emotional at each other. Personally, I value truth over politeness. And I think that when 
we are gonna discuss this, that it's very likely that temp tempers will, will flare, especially between those people who live on a street who, um, who see this as a trivial issue and who don't wanna be inconvenienced by having to spend all that time getting new return addresses for their envelopes um, versus those people who've dedicated their lives for justice and equality. So I, I think we should be willing to have that discussion even if it gets a little hot, even if it gets a little heavy, uh, because I, th I think it's very important for us to move forward as a community. Um, before I turn it over to the city manager, very quickly, I just want to say that uh, we have been pleased previously with the report of the Stormwater Task Force and the work that their members did. And I have to tell you that the, the work that you folks have done on a topic that is not nearly as clear cut, if you will, as a stormwater task force. I, I, I have participated in these meetings uh, since the inception and the dedication of all the members, Susan, Holly, Mimi, Don, Andrew, Esley, and Alice, thank you to all of you for your dedication to our community. I know that Susan and one of her, uh, uh, one of the uh, sheets we have, uh, wanted to make sure that we thanked uh, Errol Tate and Larry Reese for all of their work that they have done in supporting this effort. Um, clearly, I know the city manager is going to probably have uh, uh, the next steps in this because we've got to figure out how we're going to work this through staff wise. And with that, to all of the members of the task force, I know I speak on behalf of my colleagues and saying thank you for your dedication uh, to making University City a better place to right the wrongs that I think probably a lot of people didn't know were wrongs at that time, as far as naming streets. And we will do our best to move this forward in the right, in the, in the right way, the right fashion, uh, taking everything you said into consideration. And then as Don said, taking those heated comments that we know are going to come our way in the near term. Uh, with that, I would like to turn it over to the city manager prior to adjournment. Honorable Mayor, Council members and members of the task force. The next steps that we will take is to look to identify what the process is for changing uh, the name of streets. Uh, certainly I'll work with the mayor and council as far as what your priorities are. I would want to uh, share with you that this is a complicated process. Uh, as you've identified, a number of people uh, will likely be inconvenienced uh, if the mayor and council decide to, uh, to change uh, some of the street names. So what's important uh, to keep in mind is that we're not interested necessarily in doing things fast, we're interested in doing it right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we have to go through the process that is needed to make sure that everyone that will be impacted will also have input. Mayor, that concludes my uh, comments as well as all of the presentations for tonight. So on behalf of the council, thank you to the task force for all of your work and for joining us this evening. We will be adjourning the study session and we will take about a five minute break if everyone is okay and we will start the city council meeting. Uh, if, if everybody gets back early, we'll start it at, uh, uh, as soon as everybody gets back or at the latest at 635. Susan and to everyone, thank you again. Thank you very much. You're, welcome. Oh, you're quite welcome. Good night.